My meeting with Dr. Shrew didn't go as expected at all. He provided some answers, but I left with even more questions. I knew he wanted me to give it some time, but I really wasn't sure I wanted to even go back. I didn't sleep at all that night, but I did decide to return the next day. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to what was going on down in the basement, and the only way to find out what was happening was to play along. I could take notes on what I saw, maybe find a way to gather some evidence, and get word of any wrongdoing to the proper authorities. That was the plan, anyway. The next day, I checked on my patient in cell 1 and found that he seemed to be doing fine. The stress I saw in his eyes the day before was replaced by a look of what appeared to be relief on seeing me again. I asked the guard if I could remove the man's gag, but I was told it was against protocol after another prisoner had bitten off the ear of an intern a few years prior. Adding to my previous notes on patient 1, I left the basement once more and returned to my desk. Several of my co-workers asked what the basement was like, but I wasn't able to tell them without risking my job and compromising my investigation. I didn't want to leave them completely hanging though, so I embellished what was down there and told them that the first trial seemed to be going well. Knowing I was going to need some form of respite, I stopped at a bar on the way home and helped myself to a few drinks. Not enough to get drunk, but enough that I could temporarily live with the lie I was telling myself. The cab driver that brought me home chuckled as I sang what I imagine was the greatest rendition of American Pie ever belted out in his vehicle, and he said he would be more than happy to give me a lift any time as I climbed out. I slept better that night than I had in years, but the morning was not kind. A couple of glasses of water and some greasy eggs and bacon helped stem the tide that was begging me to climb back in bed and I was off for another day in what I was now referring to as the dungeon. I started to get to know the guards as I spent more time down there. They seemed friendly enough, and they were more forthcoming than I expected when it came to information about the prisoners. I learned, for instance, that not all of them were prisoners that had been convicted of crimes. Some were vagrants taken off the street with the promise of a warm meal and some were suspected of various crimes against the country and were here in lieu of being sent to a government black site. My patient in cell 1 continued to improve over the week, finally being wheeled out on day 7 to find out if the drug had actually helped with his cancer. I didn't get to go with him for these tests, but I was handed the results a few days later that indicated there had been improvement and he had been set free. The improvement, though promising, wasn't as strong as expected according to the charts and scans, so my team got to work on improvements to the formula. Within days, a new drug was ready to go, and we were on to cell 2. This patient wasn't tied down like the first one, though he was still wearing a mask that prevented him from talking. His tag indicated that he also suffered from lung cancer, and he seemed eager to begin the trial. With the paperwork and injection complete on the second patient, I returned to my desk to follow my notes for the day and head out. Before I could leave, however, Lee motioned for me to join him in his office again. Dr. Shrew says you're adjusting well after a rough start. Yeah, I had some questions and objections early on, but I worked through them. I lied. That's good to hear. You're not the first person I've seen added to the basement but many of them didn't stick around long. I'm not sure what's down there, and I know you can't talk about it, but I'm here if you need anything. You're a great asset to the team, and I'd like to keep you around, he said, a smile growing on his face as he finished. Stopping at the bar on the way home again, I wanted to drink enough to erase the guilt of lying to Lee. He was an excellent boss, all things considered, and I wanted to avoid breaking his trust when possible. And that's more or less how the next few weeks went. Going to work, check on a patient until they were sent to be tested, and start over with a new one. I worked my way around the room, getting through eight cells before we finally received the results that we were looking for with the drug. 
It was a Monday morning when I was told I would be moving on to level B14 for the next stage of trials. There was a lot more involved in that stage, so I was told to be prepared to spend a lot more than a few minutes I had been spending with each patient on a daily basis. The training and paperwork was a lot more intense as well, taking me several days to complete before I could even get clearance to head down. Most of it was pretty standard non-disclosure type stuff, and there were a lot of new emergency procedures related to the depth I would be at below the building. Not all of the procedures were about the structure of the building, though. An entire section was dedicated to what should be done in the event of a patient biting or scratching you. The threat from the patients was apparently so great that I was being given a stun gun, with a couple of hours dedicated to training me how to use it, in addition to the armed guards that would be present at all times. This all seemed ludicrous to me, but I went along with it out of a sheer sense of curiosity. The first day of traveling down to the dungeon finally arrived, and I made my way into the elevator. Part of the new orientation for B-14 involved some training on the weird markings that labeled the lower floors. Apparently, they were a quick reference for the computer scanners, one of which I now had, that controlled access to the floors. If you had the appropriate clearance, the scanner would act as a key to allow you to get to the right floor as well as providing security reminders and tracking your location when on the floor. This last thing bothered me when I first read it, but as the doors opened to reveal the new level, it all started to make sense. The first thing I noticed was that the guard position was off to the left of a rectangular room. Camera monitors lined the wall behind the desk, and a heavily armored guard sat at the computer terminal facing the elevator. A long corridor stretched into the distance directly across from the elevator, with the side halls branching off every 20 feet or so. As I stepped onto the floor, another guard appeared from a doorway to my right, wearing the armor and carrying a gun that looked much too powerful for where he was. Greetings, Mr. Allen. Before we begin, I just need to run a quick scan to make sure you don't have anything that can be used as a weapon, he said, pulling a small device out of his pocket. Remembering the part of training pertaining to not bringing anything that could be used by a patient to harm others into the cells, I held my arms up and waited for the scan to be complete. Alright, you're clear. Please follow me. We moved down the hall at a brisk pace, walking much further than I expected. I could hear the occasional moan from various rooms along the branching hallways, but our footsteps were the loudest sound otherwise. After a few minutes in the main hallway, we took a right onto one of the branches and continued for another couple of minutes before taking a left and stopping at a door about halfway down the hall. Room 15-93, patient ID 88392. Proceed with caution. You are allotted three hours, the guard said in an almost robotic tone. I knocked lightly and made my way into the room, unsure of what to expect but bracing for the worst. There was no way I could have prepared for what I found. The room was decorated like a nursery, with pastel colors and bright lights. There was a crib against the wall to my right, and a soft-looking blanket and several stuffed animals strewn about its interior. The floor was carpeted, covered in a mess of green shag. A TV recessed into the wall behind thick glass was playing a kid's show, with the volume turned all the way down and the captions flashing as the characters spoke. It took me a minute or so to notice the figure sitting in a chair in the corner of the room. As I found my bearings, I realized the figure was a woman who was strapped into a rocking chair. Her arms are latched, though free enough that she had a small range of motion available, which she was taking advantage of to hold what I thought at first was a baby. As I moved closer, however, I realized it was just a doll. My mind was racing at that point, and my stomach made an effort to make me leap. The half-smile on the woman's face as she stared blankly at the television didn't help me feel any better, but I knew I needed to stick with it. 
I was told in training to avoid contact with patients on this level and to never speak while in the rooms. I wondered how it was going to be possible to do my job without talking or being able to get close to the patients, but it turned out that worry wasn't necessary. An IV was already in the patient's arm, with the injection port safely off to the side and several feet away. Monitors for heart rate and blood pressure were set up and keeping track of the vital signs, so all I really had to do was write down the information that was displayed on the readout and inject the drug. Once that was complete, I settled into a chair across the room to spend the next couple of hours monitoring the patient and recording their vitals every 15 minutes. I nearly dozed off more than once as I waited for the minutes to pass, but the time to leave finally came and I hurried back into the hallway to find the guard still waiting next to the door. After walking back to the guard desk in silence, I thanked the guards and told them I would be back the next day and asked them to call me if anything happened before then. I spent the rest of the day at my desk filling out the mandatory report to detail everything I did while in the basement and avoiding talking to my co-workers who were full of questions. As soon as I was finished with the paperwork, I slipped out the door and returned to what had become my nightly routine. Cab ride to the bar, drinks, stumble out to another cab, home, bed. My imagination was running away with what I saw that first day. Who was that woman? Why was she there? The file had indicated she had terminal lung cancer and not much time, but how many more like her were on that floor? I arrived the next morning on B-14 to find out the woman had been cleared overnight as cured and released. That's not possible. Why didn't anyone call me? I asked as the guard handed me a new patient file. We were instructed to inform you when you arrive today. If you'll please follow me, I'll escort you to the new room. The guard responded. I might have been in shock at the whole thing. I'm not really sure. There isn't a drug in the world that can cure any disease that fast. I didn't even pay attention to the path we were taking as we wound deeper into the facility. Finally winding up at room 15-2962, Patient 363-949. This room was decorated like an office, with walls painted to look like bookshelves and a large flat screen TV encased in the wall displaying an outdoor scene as if it were a window to the outside world. The patient was also strapped into a chair, but he was staring at me and grinning as I went about my work. It appeared that none of the patients on this level were going to have mouth coverings, making me appreciate the fact that I didn't need to get close. I assumed it would be another boring three hours as I monitored his vitals, but I wasn't that lucky. Hey there, Doc, he said, speaking for the first time after just the 15-minute mark. I kept my eyes on the paperwork, desperate to pretend I wasn't there. No, 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 don't speak. I was just curious about when I might get out of here. They promised me I would be leaving soon, and I'm just dying to get out, he said, emphasizing the word dying as his smile somehow widened. He didn't speak again over the remaining couple of hours, but my nerves were ready to crack when the time ended. I rushed back into the hallway, closing the door a little too hard behind me. Just before the door latched, he got one more line in. See you tomorrow. Oh wait, no I won't. I was shaking as I followed the guard back to the elevator. I couldn't come back. Whatever was going on, I didn't want to be a part of it anymore. As soon as I got back upstairs, I went to see Dr. Shrew. I'm sorry, I can't do this anymore, I said, as I sat down across from him. Well, you aren't the first to get cold feet. Did something happen? The patient's on B-14. My nerves just can't take it, I said, taking the cigarette from his outstretched hand. That floor can be a hard one for sure, but you've helped so many people already. 
There's only a few weeks left on this phase. Can't you just hold out a little longer? He said as he leaned back and lit his own cigarette. I really can't. How did the first patient get cured so quick? And what do they know? The guy I saw today said he wouldn't be there tomorrow. Did he now? Well, that's good to know. They aren't supposed to speak. The woman you treated yesterday was healed. The drug you gave her killed the cancer and she left this morning. She just had a baby, you see, when she found out she was terminal. We gave her a new chance. You gave her a new chance, he said. Can I go visit her? Maybe I could handle staying if I just had the chance to talk to someone who had been cured. <sighs> I knew this day would be coming, though I had hoped it would take a bit longer to get here. I'm afraid you can't visit her. I accept your resignation. Please clean out your desk, and security will escort you from the premises, he said, turning in his chair to face the window behind him. Standing up, my head was spinning. The conversation had ended much more abruptly than I expected, and my legs felt like they were going to give out at any minute, as I left the office and made my way back to my desk. I had just finished gathering my things when a security guard showed up to lead me out. My entire team was watching, all of them looking at me like I'd done something horrible. Even Lee was scowling as I passed his office, glancing at me only briefly. The guard hit the button on the elevator and the doors closed. As we started to move down, I glanced over at the panel and noticed that the button for the ground floor wasn't lit as it should have been. Instead, B-11 was highlighted. My heart started racing and my stomach turned. Had the guard hit the wrong button? Why were we going to that floor? I didn't have a lot of time to plan, but as the elevator came to a stop, I knew what I needed to do. As the doors opened, I scanned the floor in front of me as quick as I could and bolted from the car without a word, moving toward a hallway on my left. I could hear the guard yelling, but he didn't give chase. The hallways seemed never-ending. Some were well lit and others were dark and foreboding. I ran for several minutes before finally stopping to catch my breath and look around. The first thing I noticed was a lack of doors. The walls were all painted fuchsia, or a shade close to it. When I felt sure the guard hadn't followed me, I started to walk around, looking for a way out. I have no idea how much time passed. It must have been hours before I realized this maze was much bigger than I could have anticipated. I ran into so many dead ends that I lost track of them. I was on the verge of giving up when I spotted a door that led to this room. The only thing in here was a stock of paper and pens, so I figured the best use of my time right now would be to write down everything in the hopes that someone will find and expose the Nautos for what it really is. I'm going to try and map out this labyrinth, but I don't have a lot of faith in my ability to get out. I've been seeing shadows and hearing whispers down here. I don't know what B-11 has in store for me, but I'll keep pushing on until the bitter end, no matter what's out there. Oh, <laughs> my